We are live. I forgot to put my computer on the hotspot, but it's on there anyway because my computer knows what's up. All right, what's up, everyone? Today we're gonna have a fun one. So this this um, this video, this presentation will be uh, one of the classic Lance rants to begin with, and then I'll take a look at some Q and A's in the chat. But hopefully, I'll answer most of that um, in this. So today's video or today's talk, whatever you want to call it, is going to be on variable RPM in grinders. So as we know, years ago, variable RPM was introduced into grinding. And just like everything in the coffee world, when someone has something new, they immediately begin to make reasons as to why it's a necessary component to have. And it so the, the number one contender of what it is, people have boiled it down to a very black and white reasoning. They say, okay, higher RPM equals more fines, lower RPM equals less fines, done. And so everyone's trying to get this lower RPM. It's become almost a mandated feature on new grinders. Why would I spend $2,000 on a grinder that doesn't have variable RPM? Just add it, right? Um, and so I just, today's video, I'm going to talk about how that is first off incorrect, just right off the bat. It is not automatically equal more fines, less fines. That's absolutely not what's going on. Can that happen? Sure. But is that the case in the majority of the time? Absolutely not. So, uh, today we're going to talk about, uh, some discoveries that I've made as well as some, um, some data that I've come across as well as a massive, experiment I'm about to do uh, by collecting a lot of particle size distributions. Uh, I still don't have my particle analyzer, but Dr. Al Shamari that I referenced in my distribution videos has kindly offered for me to send him my samples from here to the Netherlands in order to read them on his analyzer. So I'm going to send him about 50 or 60 samples and he's going to read them all uh, or measure them all. And then we'll have a much better idea more objectively of what's going on with particle size distribution with variable RPM. So for those of you that are watching and that aren't, aren't understanding what I mean by that, I simply mean there are grinders now that have built in variable speeds, meaning you can control the burr rate between a certain margin. So sometimes it, like with the Kafatech monolith, I think it's like from five RPM all the way up to 400 rotations per minute, which five is insanely slow. That's way slower than hand grinding. Then you have uh, something like the DF83, uh, which is beside me right now, the DF83V. It can go down to 300 RPM and up to 1600 RPM. And that's kind of the idea. You have different grinders coming out with these variable RPMs. But the question is, like, what, what do you do with that? What is, what's the purpose of it? And so for a while, I was bucking against people who were saying it's across the board, more, more speed, more, more fines, lower speed, lower fines. And so people were just opting for lower fines and were swearing to how it was so much better, regardless of the grinder. It was just across the board. This is what it is. But I, I would buck back and say, that's not what it is. I'm sorry. That's, that's simply not it. Um, that being said, it is it in some instances. Uh, but in the instances I was choosing my battles, I was right, um, of course. So what, what I was seeing is a lot of people with flat burr grinders were consistently saying, yes, that's what's happening. That's what's happening. It's a, it's deal done. I'm like, well, there's absolutely no proof to that. Now, there is some proof that with cone burrs, and I am speaking broadly here, but with the majority of cone burrs that I have seen, that is the case. The particle size distribution is greatly affected by speed. And this is something we have come to understand over time. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> <clears throat> I've gotten hit with uh, either really insane allergies or a cold lately, so I'm a bit congested. But anyway, so what uh, with, with cone burrs, you can greatly see this. This is very easy to see. And there are a lot of tests that I'm going to talk about you can run at home uh, in order to kind of see this yourself. But uh, essentially, when you're using cone burr grinders, because they're such a different, it's such a different way of, of cutting up the bean than using something like a flat burr grinder. You have uh, you have something like that where the lower RPM uh, tends to produce a bit uh, less fines, essentially less smaller particles are created. Um, and then another theory that people have is, well, if it's a faster RPM, it's going to cause more heat. Lower RPM is going to cause lower heat. Sure, if grinding was that simple, if it was as simple as the faster RPM is going to make a faster throughput and it's going to have less contact. Arguably, but that's again not how it's working. In an ideal world, if everything else in the grinding process was ideal, then yes, that could be the case, but it's not the case. You can't just take a DF83V and say, I'm going to go to 300, there's going to be less heat created. That's not the case. Um, so that's kind of what we're going to talk about in today's rant. By the way, I'm drinking a Cedra, 
from Pepe uh, in, in Fica Soledad. Um, it's a bit aged now. It's a coffee I got uh, roasted by Say uh, that I picked up when I was in Paris at Motors Coffee. Uh, I got his little Pepe pack. Um, but yeah, so I'm drinking this. And I hope you all are brewing something tasty. All right, so what is going on variable RPM? How can we use this to help us dial in? If it's not actually doing that, what is it doing? Well, for a while I was kind of saying, because of what I had seen, that flat burrs roughly were not changing particle size distribution. They were simply shifting the peak particle size. And the way that I was able to prove this, or at least give some proof to it, is whenever I would take like my EG1, for instance, and I would use the core burrs, or I would use the ULF burrs in it, I would dial in a, a coffee, an espresso, at 500 RPM, okay? Dial it in, we're at 500 RPM, good. I'm set at, let's say I'm set at the number two. Then what I would do is at the same burr gap, the same burr aperture, not changing the dial at all, I would crank it up to 1500 RPM, I would dose my beans, and I would pull a shot. And what would happen is the shot would go a lot, a lot, a lot faster. So then I would have to go much finer I, this is why we shouldn't speak about finer and coarser on a dial because that's not necessarily true if we have variable RPM. So instead of uh, what I would have to do is decrease the burr gap between those burrs in order to create enough resistance. Now, if you wanted to say, well, it's dealing with just fines, well, then you would expect the opposite to happen when you go to 1500 RPM. You would expect a lot more fines to be created. And what you would expect is to have to go coarser on the grind size. But the opposite is happening, which kind of tells us that what's happening is more so a shift in the peak particle. And there is some data to suggest this is happening, but only with a few burrs. Now, the reason we can't extrapolate that with the transitive property and say this happens to all flats is because then you have something like the base burrs from Weber. Now, in my testing when I was doing the EG1, I also did the base burrs at both 500 RPM and 1500 RPM. And essentially the exact opposite thing happened. So whenever I was doing, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped a point. Uh, the way that I could show you that the peak particle was changing, and this is an objective proof, but it's good proof, is I would measure the extraction yield after I redialed in the coffee at the higher RPM. So if you remember on the core burrs, on the ULF burrs at 500 RPM, I was getting my, my shot, my recipe, whatever I dialed into, let's say for, you know, uh, giggles, let's say it was 20 grams in, 40 grams out in 30 seconds. It wasn't that, but let's say it was. So let's say I dialed in 500 RPM to get me this with my coffee, 20 and 40 out 30 seconds. Then I moved to 15 RPM. It would be 20 and 40 out in like 15 seconds. So then I would redial the coffee in order to hit that 30 second time mark. And when I would, ex when I would refract it, I was getting almost identical refractions. You extrapolate that out to a bigger sample size and it was there was it was within the same margin of error. So I was essentially getting the same extraction yield with both RPMs. Now what is it extracting you could argue is different potentially or we could also just say it's the same particle size distribution just shifting the peak. And that's because of the the speed at which those grounds, the the speed at which those beans are able to move through the 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 burrs are causing a di are causing a difference in the way that they are interacting with the burrs and with the other grounds. So yes, it could be a different particle size distribution, and it's just giving us the same extraction. But when it's replicated across a few different burrs, it seems like maybe we're just shifting the particle peak size. But that, that stands to be uh, stands to be understood. We need to have more RPMs. We need to have uh, actual laser data, laser diffraction on this to more understand it. So um, that's part of what I'll be doing in this new big data collection that I'll be conducting here in the in the near future. All right. So now with the base burrs, what was interesting is I would do 500 RPM, 20 in, 40 out in 30 seconds. Then I'll go to 1500 RPM. And what happened kind of blew my mind. Whenever I redialed, the extraction percentage was way different, like 3% different. It was crazy. And this actually aligns with how cone burrs react. If you were to take a Weber key, something that has variable RPM, the max cool, Aries max cool, or something else that's cone burr with variable RPM, you will see the same phenomenon occurring. You will see at a lower RPM, 
dialed espresso, you jump up RPM at the same burr gap, and you're going to have a very different extraction. Even if you redial into that same recipe, it's going to give you a much different extraction yield, which is showing us that definitely the particle size distribution is changing massively. And that is that is more objective because even if we don't know what, like there's a chance on those flat burr tests that the particle size distribution was the same. There's a chance. There's also a chance it wasn't the same and they just were extracting the same way or the same percentage. We don't know what builds up that percentage of extraction. There's a lot of potential extraction. We don't know what it's extracting, but we do know that's not a, that's not an option with the base burrs or with cone burrs because the extraction wasn't even the same extraction. At that same recipe, the efficiency of those burrs went down, right? So really high RPM with those base burrs was giving us a lower extraction than the slow RPM was, which is similar to cone burrs. If you take, like I said, the max or the key or whatever, and you do low RPM, then you crank it up to the highest RPM and redial it in, you're going to get a lower extraction. So we know that RPM is not simply more fines, less fines. Arguably, that is part of the issue whenever it's cone burrs or the base burrs, which, by the way, what's interesting is Doug said years ago, he created his base burr set for the EG1 to replicate cones. And it's kind of mind blowing that that's the only burr set that I've tested that actually does replicate cone burrs. I've, everything else kind of does what I said the ULFs and the core burrs do, regardless of it being 64 millimeter or 98 millimeter. The ones that I've actually paid attention to replicate those other ones, which is you redial it and it seems to hit within the same extraction percentage. Whereas with the base burrs, they dipped like 3%. With cones, they dip like 2 or 3%. So, but that's over a thousand RPM change. I don't think the I don't think the Aries can do nearly that big of a gap. So you may not get that big of a drop of extraction, but probably a percent and a half, something like that. But obviously, this is testing that I will be doing. I just wanted to kind of give you the theory. Uh, this is kind of a preface to what that video will be, which will be a big undertaking. But I'm excited to do it because I think it's a really nice thing, especially now that all these commercial grinders are coming out with variable RPM. What is a barista supposed to do with that? Like. Why does that matter behind bar? What coffee to coffee? Like what? It's all anecdotal at this point. Like, oh, I think it tastes better. And now you are you're so brainwashed into thinking that less fines means better. That's been a huge topic in coffee for forever. Oh, that one produces more fines. It's a worse grinder. That's not true either. That, that that's that's just that's just hogwash. So, uh, but we're we're kind of brainwashed into believing this. And so because of that, we see. Oh, lower RPM means less fines. So I sh uh, and then you start looking for qualities of lower fines and maybe your brain tricks you into tasting that. And then at higher fines, you're saying, oh, it should be more bitter. And maybe you're just focusing on different aspects of a very similar brew. Or you're not redialing at the higher RPM. And so like with filter coffee, a lot of people don't redial because they don't think of that. They just think, oh, yeah, it's so good for filter coffee. When in reality, you don't have the same uh, parameters as espresso. So the drain time might not be that different. And so you're not thinking to redial at the higher RPM. And so you might be thinking, oh, wow, the, the slower RPM is better. But it might be because it's dialed in better. Right. So there's a lot of conjecture, a lot of anecdotal evidence as to what's going on with variable RPM. But in reality, it all comes down to a lot of different variables, a few of which I'll name right now. It comes down to burr size, comes down to burr geometry. It comes down to whether there's a pre-breaking mechanism and how efficient that mechanism is. It comes down to uh, uh, if it's flat or cone burr. I don't know if I already said that. My brain's kind of leaving me. It, it comes down to a, a, a thing. A, just loads of different variables that are difficult to really control, uh, especially when you're trying to give a one size fits all. That's not how coffee works. And it's definitely not how burrs work with the quickly expanding uh, grinder landscape out there. So something else that I thought was really interesting is I was very confident about this understanding that whenever you switch that particle peak or when, oh, I'm sorry, whenever you switch that RPM, that you should be getting a grossly different time of extraction because the peak particle is shifting, right? Either that or you're getting a different particle size distribution. Therefore, you're getting uh, um, the, the effects of the cones or of the base burrs, right? So are you following me? I hope you're following me. If not, go back and listen to that again. So uh, I was pretty confident about this because it was it was my experience, right? This is from all the different grinders I've had. This is the experience I've I've encountered is Whenever it's like this, whenever it's ground at 500, 600, 800 RPM, and then you up at a few hundred RPM, 
boom, we have a completely different extraction that's much faster. That's the common thing that happens is faster extraction. And so whether or not it's a difference in particle size distribution, like I said, I can't know because I've not done that testing yet, but I was very confident about it. Well, recently I was at San Remo and they were, uh, you know, I was, I was in their, their lab and I was, they were talking to me about their X1 grinder. And so I was just pulling some shots with it and I made it, they showed me like a presentation on it and they say in the presentation that variable RPM does not change particle size distribution. It doesn't change anything uh, except maybe the flavor based off of heating of the grounds. So this is in their presentation. They actually said that the person who helped them conduct this was Dr. Samo Smirke. And I'm going, wait a second. My boy Samo did that? Yeah, right. Man, I know what Samo thinks. Come on. I chat with him on the daily. What are you talking about? And so he's like, I'm telling you, this was from his data that was ran at Jaw at uh, Zurich's uh, Applied Science. And I'm going, that can't be right. So I, you know, of course I challenged them because I got it. I got to get to the bottom of this. And they have a laser particle analyzer at their, at their factory. So I was like, all right, how about this? I'll, I'll show you. That's what I said. I'll show you. Very confident of me because I'd done this so many times, right? So I took the coffee. I ground it at eight, they do from 800 to 1400 RPM. I took the coffee, dialed it into, let's say 20 and 40 out 30 seconds. I don't remember what it was, but it was on one of their cafe racers. <coughs> I dialed it in, pulled some shots, just make sure it was stabilized. And we filmed it and ensured we saw first drop. We saw how much was on the scale and what time, all that good stuff. Then I went up, same burr aperture. I went all the way up to 1400 RPM. And I was like, watch this. Grind the coffee into it, tamp it, do it, video it, and it ran at roughly the same time. I was like, hold up. I got I'm, it's probably just because I switched grind size. There may have been some left over, something happened. Pulled another one, same time. What's going on? Pulled another one, same time. And he said, if you want, I can analyze these particles for you. And I said, Yeah, let's do that. So we took samples of both 800 and at 1400 RPM. He went and ran it. The particle sizes overlapped pretty much identically. Like as close as two samples from the same grind set, as close as those would met, match, literally. If you were to grind two doses at the same, on the like let's say we have our EG1 and we grind a 10 gram dose, a 10 gram dose, and we measure a pinch out of each of those, that's how that's how much these overlapped, even though they're vastly different RPMs. And I'm going, hold up. This is challenging what I was understanding. And this is why I spurred on this, like, oh, I just need to get to the bottom of this at some point. Um, and so what I'm very confident is happening is they, there's a very robust auger, like robust auger in the X1, like big boy. It's like that. It's like chunky and it's it, it fits very tightly into the into the grind chamber. That was very suggestive, all of that. I apologize, but I don't know how else to describe it. And so it's very efficient at slowly meeting those coffee, the coffee into the burrs itself. Okay. So because of that, because it's not changing the feed rate into the burrs, because it's, it's still going to bring it in essentially at that same time, it's not really changing the particle size distribution. So because of how effective the pre-breaker is and how effective it is at feeding the beans into the burrs, it didn't really change the particle size distribution. That started to think, oh, all these grinders I was testing for the most part either had a really weak auger that didn't really do much. Like on the DF83V, the auger doesn't really do much. Um, the Zerno does, but it's not variable RPM. Um, and, and, and the Bentwood does, but it's not variable RPM. So I've not really had, and so is the EK43, but it's not variable RPM. So I've not been able to actually test out a really robust auger feeding system in how it's relation how it relates to actually changing during variable RPM. So um, so then it started to make sense. I was going, oh, it's because of how this auger is working. It's disallowing the changes from variable RPM, which is pretty astonishing, right? That, that, that was like, oh my God, that's another variable to consider is how robust the auger is and actually, and how efficient I should say at what it should be doing, which is breaking up the beans in order to feed the burrs at a constant rate. So that kind of, that, so, and sorry about the background noise. There's some construction going on outside. So that kind of like threw a wrench into it. And that's really sent me down like, okay, now I really have to understand this. It makes sense. Don't get me wrong. It makes sense. Whenever you're doing a faster RPM, what you're thinking about is the pre-breaking is a lot more uh, violent. And like, let's say something that's direct feed, like a DF60, DF64V. 
you, you dump the beans in, it's direct onto the burrs immediately. So the faster it's going, the quicker it's pulverizing them and the quicker it's shooting them out. Is the throughput time quicker of each individual bean? Some of them are, some of them aren't. So what you're getting is a different, you're getting a different interfacial experience of those ground up coffee beans than you would in something that is more evenly meeting those beans into the burr. So you get the same feed rate essentially in something that is not auger fed or that doesn't have an efficient auger. In an auger, the feeding rate is linear or is correlated with the burr speed. So the faster the burrs are going, the quicker it's feeding it to make up for the difference in the RPM. And it's also cutting them more aggressively. So the burrs don't have as much work to do. So it's not going to cause any of that, those potential issues that we're getting in something like the DF64V or in the Aries because it's direct or in the uh, key because it's direct. So that, 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 that threw another wrench. And I was like, what is happening? So of course I immediately sent the data to Gagne and he was like, never thought about that, but it does make sense. And so we're sitting there chatting and like, yeah, okay, I guess if you have an efficient auger, then that's what's going on. And that's actually a thing. And, and I'm going to drop a little, you know, a little something here for you all, because I don't think everyone's going to watch this before I drop my, uh, um, my video that I was teasing on Instagram about um, the different grind sizes. But I think that uh, it, there's definitely something to be said about having an auger that is more efficient than just throwing an auger in for the purpose of activating an auger. You essentially need an auger for the most part when you get a vertically mounted burr set. And because now all these grinders want to do vertically mounted burr sets, they're just using an auger in order to help move the beans. But that doesn't mean they're efficient at moving the beans or at breaking the beans. The Zerno is very efficient. DF83V, not very efficient. My, my guess is the Gevi is not going to be very efficient. I've yet to test it. I'm actually going to probably after this video just to see if it aligns. But what I saw is whenever you slow feed, so the, the secret on my Instagram, by the way, was slow feeding. Um, when you slow feed, you are getting more cutting than you are mushing, okay? You're allowing the throughput of the beans to be more uh, um, efficient, right? So instead of the beans being caught inside the burrs and they're mushing against other beans and those burrs are pushing them together, mushing them, mushing them, and creating a smaller grind size and a more you know, more uh, wide or particle distribution. When you slow feed, you're allowing the burrs to do what they're supposed to do without intervention from other grounds, okay? So you would imagine that with a really efficient auger or just an auger in general, you would imagine that slow feeding should not have a big effect because that auger is supposed to slowly feed the burrs anyway, right? So you would imagine the DF83V, it shouldn't affect it very much, slow feeding, but that's the furthest thing from the truth. I dialed in espresso on my DF83V at, uh, and I just did a constant RPM. I wasn't messing with RPM in this video, just feed rate. I dialed it in at just a full dose. I just dumped it in, dialed it in, dialed it into espresso. I don't remember what the shot was, but let's say 20 and 40 out 30 seconds. Actually, I do remember it was 18 and 40 out and it was in 25 seconds. Dialed it in. And then I just trickled it in. I didn't do bean by bean. I just sat there and I just trickled it in probably over five seconds. And it took 10 seconds for the shot. And I was like, well, that actually was against my expectation. I assumed the auger would be more efficient than that, but it's simply not. Then I did it to the Zerno. I dialed it in, 18 in, 40 out. And I was like, surely this won't have a big difference because it is a robust pre-breaking auger. They literally made the auger to fit very tightly into that chamber so that it would slow the feed down. It wouldn't let them just go with the velocity. It would slow the feed down and break them up. And it actually takes a lot of torque from the motor to do that. So... I was like, surely this won't happen. But I, I've already, I had already filmed the video before I did the side by side with the Zerno. And I was sitting there going, oh my goodness, am I going to have to redo this if the Zerno also is not making a difference? Because I said in the video, I would imagine uh, the, the more efficient pre breakers should be doing a better job. And I was like, what if I was wrong? So last night I quickly came out and ran some tests. And the Zerno, once dialed in at 18 in, 40 out, was giving me margin of error of the same time, even at slow feed. So I even went down to bare, like almost a bean at a time just to make sure. And it would give me, uh, my shots were running an average of 23 seconds. So 25 second was my dial with a full dump. The Zerno gave me 23 seconds with a slow feed. So slow feeding is almost a moot point on the Zerno for the most part. Maybe you're getting marginal gains, but for the most part, it's moot. Okay. DF83, massive difference. I'm assuming the Gevi, massive difference. I'm assuming the Time More, massive difference. And it's because the auger is... <clears throat> sorry, 
And it's because the auger is not tightly in that chamber. It is kind of just in there to help, you know, encourage the beans to leave, right? It's not like there's no room uh, other than to go uh, uh, with the, the flow of that auger. It's just kind of like, it's kind of like a middleman. It's like the baton, you know, I don't know. That doesn't make sense. But um, so, yes, uh, that was that was kind of like a wow, a revelation for me. Um, so augers are not not all not all augers are, are built the same. And I've been praising augers as if you followed me for a while, you know, I've praised augers for years. Ever since my Bentwood video, I was like, yes, pre-breaking auger is brilliant. But I think any auger is going to pre-break to an extent. All augers are great. And I still believe that I think augers are really nice. But there's obviously a level of efficiency that it, it, that needs to be hit in order for the auger to be truly beneficial. I'm not so sure it's that beneficial in the DF83V. And another reason for this is I actually saw that Joe Kolb uh, of Turin, I saw in his Facebook group, that they he and Baird have done a lot of testing. And they have found out that um, a lot of the issues people have with inconsistency on the DF83V is due to it heating up. You would imagine heating up would not be that big of an issue if the auger was doing a great job at pre-breaking. If it was, there shouldn't be that much interfacial heat up in the burrs because they should be grinding up fragments of beans and not beans. It should be doing a lot less work. The auger should be carrying a bulk of the work, right? But it's not. So there's something to be said about the efficiency of the auger. Okay, I think I've hit all the main topics I wanted to hit. This video, like I said, is not the objective presentation of variable RPM. I think what I, I want to do every now and then on this channel is to, uh, I'm a very verbal um, processor. I like to verbally process things. And so I think this is a good way for me to give ideas that I have because I don't want to like keep secretive my ideas. I mean, maybe to build hype like I did with the distribution video or with, with my slow feed video. But, you know, I'm not that worried about it. I like a little mystique, but I, don't, I really don't like surprises. So uh, I think this is a, a good way to do that. And giving you all, you know, an option to funnel some questions and that will help me in creating that video to know what I need to respond to. Okay. Now I am looking at the chat. So for anyone who's listening, so I will upload this on the podcast. Um, I'm now looking at the chat for a second. I have to pull it back up because it wasn't loading. Is it site? You stupid YouTube app. Give me it. Let's see. Let's see. Here. Oh, shoot. I just shut down the chat. What am I doing? Lance, you are acting like a silly boy. Okay. Stop. Okay. Ads kept popping up. Okay, there actually aren't many. Uh... Five RPM is equivalent to mashing. Someone says yes. Honestly, that would be mashing. I don't. I think you do need some velocity in order to do it. And this. Oh, actually, I was going to bring up hand grinding. I do think hand grinder RPM is going to affect your cut profile. So if you sit there, you could you could get up to two hundred RPM with your hand. You could. That's not that hard. So if you think about it. If you think about it, 210 RPM, or let's say let's say 180 RPM, that's three revolutions a second. So that's like one, two, three, four, five, six. You could do that. It's silly, and it would hurt your arm, but you could do it. You could get to 180 RPM. You could do it. Um, so your hand goes up to like 180 RPM, or or you could do you know, one 60 RPM, right? So those are going to give you two vastly different cups. They just are. Uh, and it's because of cones. As I said, they're going to give you different cups. Now, the question is, as I was saying earlier, lower can mean less fines and better distribution, but you have to start thinking, all right, at what point am I mashing the beans as opposed to using the cutting capability? That's what we want to do is these burrs are created in a way that what they were designed to do. Whenever we introduce mashing or we introduce regrinding because there's too much feed, that's something that people really misunderstood in my P100 review. When I said regrinding, I don't necessarily mean the grounds are coming out and coming back into the burrs. That would be impossible, especially as it's spinning. That's literally impossible. But regrinding, it means they've already passed a section of the teeth and they sit in there because they can't escape and they regrind and they grind against each other and they grind against the blades. And so in order to optimize that system, Slow feeding really helps, especially with direct feed grinders. You'll see a massive difference. Yes, it's annoying. And yes, honestly, the rate at which you feed is going to be another variable to control. So if you get an automated slow feed or something, that would be really helpful. But um, with hand grinders, it, it, it's uh, 
Uh, there's a point at which you can be mashing. You know, when you're doing this, you can feel it mash instead of crack. You want to go to a speed at which it's cracking it because you want it to be cuts. You don't want it to be mashes. Okay. All right. Let's see. Late to the party, but I just got my 078 delivered last night. This video couldn't be better time for me. Nice. Variable auger speed wind. That's actually something that I know someone is working on. Um, I believe it's Zer uh, not I believe Zerno is working on a variable uh, RPM auger, um, which would be really interesting, actually. Very interesting, especially if you could hold it constant and you could play with specifically changing the burst speed and then holding the burst speed constant and specifically changing the auger speed. That would open up a lot of fun, but obviously that would be really overwhelming for a lot of people. Uh, but we're in, we're, we're an exciting area of coffee where there's not just an area of coffee, like this is just coffee in general, so much, most of coffee and, and, and extraction dynamics, grinding dynamics, uh, production of it, roasting of it, brewing of it, it's all so unknown. There's so little science out there. That's why I want to really try to contribute to that uh, endeavor, regardless of how, you know, uh, right off the bat, people see the distribution video. They're like, oh, that's so over the top. We don't need to do that, blah, blah, blah. What people aren't realizing is I wasn't endorsing this shaking method. What it is, is I'm trying to propose or or not even propose. I'm trying to investigate and understand what is happening in these distributions in order to better inform us going forward. When Andy Schechter first put a PID controller on his home espresso machine in the early 2000s, there was not a single commercial machine with PID control. In fact, it was only after he did that to his home machine that it started to make its way into commercial. It's because the people at La Marzocco was made aware of his posts online. That's the real story of how PID controllers made it to espresso machines. Yes, PID controlling was created in the 50s and 60s, but it didn't make its way into coffee until then. At that time, people were saying, you don't need a PID controller, just temp serve, just do this, do that. And But then it happened. Now imagine if that was the YouTube era where we had loads of home enthusiasts who were married to this specific way of temp surfing and it was the best and PID was proposed. They're going to freak out. Same with WDT. If it was in the modern era where it was first proposed, people would freak out. And they did at the time. They thought it was unnecessary and it only really hit 10 years after it was proposed. So it, what's happening is more so that we're in an exciting era where we're able to propose certain ideas, certain anecdotes, certain theories, certain speculations. And it's helpful because then we now have a much broader sample size of people from all over the world that are able to replicate and try it. Now, the big issue is, is a lot of people are not doing it with any type of standard. So they're kind of doing it and allowing confirmation bias to reign supreme, but it is still a very fun time to be in coffee. In 50 years, when a lot more stuff's figured out, it'll still be fun, I'm sure of it, but it won't be as experimental as it is right now, which I'm so excited to be a part of it. Anyway, let me get back to these. Uh, late to the, oh wait, uh, meaning that grind rate at the burr is slower than auger feed rate. Uh, I don't know what that was in reference to, but I'm going to try to respond to this anyway. Grind rate at the burr is slower than auger feed rate. So uh, actually, yes, that, that is true. The feed rate, unless in normal and in, in lower efficient augers, yes. In very efficient augers, no. So the Zerno, for instance, is a very efficient, slowly meeting. That's why it takes... In fact, at the rate I was slow feeding my Zerno, the time it took to grind the coffee was the same as if I fully dosed it in within maybe half a second. And it's because it's not going to allow those beans to get to the burrs until they need to get there. So that auger is like bringing it in pretty slowly. Uh, but on these less efficient ones, that auger is shooting them into the burrs, which shows that A, it's not taking enough time or torque in order to create cracks in it. And so that the, the beans are full beans by the time they reach, for the most part, by the time they reach the burrs. And so the burrs are doing that all that duty all at a lot faster time, right? So, yeah. Um, what's your impression of the DF83 in general? Uh, thus far, I mean, it's, it, it does a solid job. Um, I've not noticed, I've not done enough shots back to back to back to back with it yet to see this inconsistency I've been seeing in the Facebook group. Um, but that's not to say it's not there. I just haven't done back to back to back to back shots with it. I've been using it every now and then to like pull example shots and videos or something like that just to get the feel for it. Um, but I'm about to do like a deep dive on it over the next week um, to like 
uh, you know, really get back to back to back shots on it. I have a good feeling on how it dials. I have a good feeling on how uh, everything kind of works on it, but I need to really deep dive on it. If it has the same consistency as the DF64 Gen 2, I'd be very happy because that Gen 2 has incredible consistency. Um, granted, I was vacuuming it to cool down the burrs, but um, it, it, I did not, it was great. So um, I'm assuming it'll be good, um, especially at the price point. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't have uh, finalized thoughts just yet. Um, EK43 is slow feeding. Very small difference. Very small difference. That's the thing I was saying with bigger burrs. You're having a lot more surface area to spread out the grinding, the distribution of the grinding, right? So of the work, I should say, not the particle distribution, the distribution of the work across that burr face. It's much bigger surface area. So it, I have talked a lot in the past about how bigger burrs don't mean better, and that's true. Bigger burrs don't mean better. But I also said in the past, bigger burrs mean more potential. You could have big burrs that have a terrible geometry and awful alignment. It's going to be worse than a really well-aligned 64 millimeter burr. But if you optimize a 98 millimeter burr and you optimize a 64 millimeter burr, the 98 will win objectively, hands down, period, no questions asked. And it's simply because it is able to displace the heat that is produced during grinding a lot more efficiently. There's a lot more surface area for that beam to be in contact with blades as opposed to getting caught up. Uh, and so there's a lot of these different things you have to take into account when we're talking about burr size. Um, it's not just size, but yes, if all things are as good as they can be, the bigger will be the better, period. Um, but that's just not the case. Not everything's perfect. Uh, like for instance, I would take, personally, I would take my Zerno with 64 millimeter multi-purpose burrs from SSP. I would take that over the P100 with the ULF burrs from SSP. And it's not because the P100 is bad. It's because I don't like the 98 millimeter ULFs in the P100. It don't, it don't taste good to me. But I, it, I would take slow feeding the P100 with optimal burrs over the Zerno that makes sense. And that's because uh, the, the bigger burrs, I prefer the bigger burrs. Now changing burrs on P100 is a pain, but I would take that for the, 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 the fact that they're much bigger. Now I would take an EK43 over the P100. I would much prefer vertically mounted burrs. I'd much prefer an auger that's doing stuff. But um, that, that's kind of how it boils down is when all things are perfect. Yeah. All right. For some reason, my chat's not updating. Let me see if I can update it. There we go. Okay, cool, 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 cool. Oh, there's a lot more questions. This is much better. Okay. I'm going to go for 10 more minutes. I'm going to do a 45-minute video. We're going to do a short one. LOL, that's a short one for me. Any variable RPM heptagonal cones on the market? Yeah, yeah, you can get like the... Uh, uh, um... mm. We can always get a motor and put it on a hand grinder, right? There's a lot of um, third-party sellers that sell motors for the Commandantes, for the Easy Press OK series, things like that. And that's actually great because then you could slow feed it. If it has the motor on it, you can slow feed it into the funnel and you can get variable RPM, which is kind of fun. Um, can you show us noobs what an auger is? Yes, I absolutely can. What's the easiest auger to pull out? Oh, probably the DF83, which is sitting right here. Let me unplug it. For those of you listening on the podcast, sorry, you won't be able to see it, but I'm about to show an auger. We'll take the hopper off. Okay. So right in here, what you'll see is this ribbed cylinder. So you see that and how there are those ribs on it? It's like a screw, okay? And the idea is the coffee is fed into here. And what you're trying to do is it is, it's feeding to the front of the grinder, but the burrs are set back here, all right? So to explain it in a more visual way, the, the auger or the hopper is at the front of this grinder. And so when the beans drop directly into it, they would not hit the burrs. The burrs are backwards behind it by about, I don't know, three-ish centimeters. And so in order for those beans to be pulled to the burrs themselves, there needs to be some sort of mechanism outside of just gravity because if they're vertically mounted burrs. If they're horizontal, then gravity is fine. But because they're vertical, they need to be carried into the center of the burrs for them to spread out and go uh, and use the centrifugal force in order to you know, be ground across the surface face of the burr. So this auger has those grooves in it to kind of carry the beans back. Now, 
in theory, not only would it carry it back, but because they're they're pretty intense ridges, they would be breaking the beans, which would lessen the workload on the final burrs. But like I said, it seems that this auger is not doing too much. It is a very small auger. It's the auger itself is like three centimeters long. It's very small, um, and it's it, it, it does it just doesn't seem to be doing a great job at that. And it's probably because the majority of that auger has an open area right here where that funnel is coming in. So the auger starts here, and it doesn't have a wall to crush beans against. So it's probably actually. I need to just take the birds out and run beans through it and see how much cracking's done. But it seems that it's not doing that much. Otherwise, we would probably see a difference with a, a, less of a difference in the slow feed versus fast feed experiment. But that's what an auger is. In the Zerno, it's a much bigger uh, auger. That's actually, I might have Zerno. I have an, I have an auger. I didn't even have to take that off. So in the Zerno, this is the auger, okay? So we have a burr plate. This is where the burr goes. It's a rotating burr. So as you dump the beans into the Zerno, the, the beans hit this, come to the back, and then they go in between the burrs and then out and drops out right there. So you put the auger in like so. It connects onto a rod right here, just like so. And then as it spins... Those beans, it's a really tight chamber where the beans go in. So they go between this smooth part of the auger and the ribs of the auger, and they're being cracked against the walls of the auger, which actually takes a lot of torque, like a lot more than you would think. And so as it's spinning and it's cracking those beans, it's also slowing down the feed rate into the burrs. So it's not allowing as fast of a feed. That's another thing the Zerno is doing. There's not as big of an aperture. When you dump the beans in, they can't all just immediately get into the chamber. A lot of these other grinders, they can immediately enter the chamber because there's such a big space between the auger and the walls. This one has such a small space, it slows the feed down into the auger itself. Then the auger can meet the the, the 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 grounds or the particles or the broken shards into the burrs, right? So we'll have a burr here and we have a burr on that back plate. And as it's spinning, as this is spinning, it is shooting them out all, in all directions as it catches inside of the chamber itself and falls out of the nozzle. So that's what the Zerno pre-breaker, one of them looks like. They have variable ribs to control the speed. So you can have a much slower speed with more ribs, or you're gonna have a faster speed with less ribs, right? You have more room for them to move. Okay. So that's the idea of an auger. Is there a critical minimum RPM for hand grinder when slow feeding? So that's what I was talking about. I'm not quite sure. Um, I don't, I mean, honestly, I, I, I live in like the 100 to 120 land. I just kind of, about two, two a second, 120 probably. I go right about here and I find really nice results with it. But as I'll show in my slow feed video, and I've actually done this already in an unfiltered live and a lot of you have already adopted it. I grind almost parallel. So I'll dump my dose in and then I kind of shake it because they'll immediately want to fill those burr, burr gaps, right? So I kind of shake it to get them out of the burrs and have it, if you could see through the grinder, they're kind of laying like this, right? And so then if you barely tilt it, they're just barely trickling in and they're getting all of that, all of the burr face because as it's sitting there, it can't leave. So it's not going to stay in one place as you're spinning it, it has to move. And so you do that, you get full cutting capability. And then if you keep going and you realize there's nothing grinding, just kind of shake it a bit down to get more beans into it. It'll double the time of your grinding process, but you'll see a massive difference. Okay. So that's how to slow feed hand grinder. Uh, that's what someone just asked. Um, uh, let's see. Seconding EK questions. Was thinking about SSP brewers, but not sure if I'll need auger upgrades too for getting the best out of it. Commercial use, slow feeding, not really an option. No, you're fine. I don't have an up. Uh, well, I did get the Titus Burr Carrier. I've not actually studied to see if the auger is any different, um, which I have an EK auger right here. So this is an EK auger, EK43 auger. I don't know why I took the DFA3 apart. I had augers right below me. So this is an EK43 auger. It looks very similar to the Zerno. The biggest difference is the cavity is bigger that it sits in. So it's not uh, as slow of feeding. Uh, so, you, I mean, uh, there may be a slight improvement slow feeding the EK, but at, at the 16 or 1700 RPM, depending on your Hertz, I think it's 1450 or 1700, depending on if you're in the US or, or Europe. But anyway... Um, it, I, I think it's minimal gains. I don't slow feed my EK and I have brew burrs. I do have the Titus, uh, auger in it. So it could be, it could be a little different. I haven't, I didn't really think to look at that, to be honest with you. Um, but yeah.
Is there a variable added by how fast or slow one slow feeds? Yes. Um, I just time it. I just go by time. I count to five. One, two, three, four, five. And I get good, I get good uh consistency. So in an efficient auger, beans are able to fly through and above or around the fins, directing the beans if the auger isn't fitted tightly in the chamber. Yes, that's exactly right. Um, let's see. Oh, no, the audio. Okay, people said that they closed and opened and it was fine. All right, we're at the last minute. I'm just going to scan through, see if there's any really great questions I think would be really helpful. Um, does the efficient auger of the Zerno prevent inconsistencies due to heating if pulling back to back to back shots? It will to an extent. You're still using 64 millimeter burrs, which are inextricably going to heat up. But yes, I mean, unless you're doing 20 shots, it should be fine. That pre breaker is doing so much work. It's it's saving the final burrs, which I'm calling it the final burrs because the pre breaker is like the initial burrs essentially. It's saving that from a so what you have to think about is normally with 64 millimeter burrs. All of the work is being done by that 64 millimeter burr. All of it. Pre-breaking to final cutting, right? All the stages on those 64 millimeter burrs. In the Zerno, however, you have the pre-breaker and then the 64 millimeter burrs. So you have the pre-breaking is all done by that, that, uh, that auger. If you were to take one of the burrs out so it doesn't have the final cutting and you were to put beans through just to see how small the grounds get from the pre-breaker, they get pretty small. I mean, they get, they get like... Like you can't brew a French press with it, but they get pretty, they get cut up pretty nicely. And so the burrs are already dealing with a lot less work right off the bat, right? Um, if a grinder with an auger pulls faster shots at low RPM, does that mean the auger is just feeding the burrs more slowly? There shouldn't be change if it's a robust auger. If, gr if, if a grinder with an auger pulls faster shots at low RPM, does that mean the auger is just feeding the birds more slowly? So I, I don't think that would, um, that wouldn't be from the auger, I don't think, unless it's a, an independent speed of the auger. I think it's if it's changing in correlation with the burr speed, which it will be because the auger is the thing that's spinning with, that's spinning the burrs, unless they have it on two different axes, it shouldn't do that. Um, it could be a burr geometry thing. So maybe your burr geometry is causing faster shots, which doesn't really make sense. You would expect slower shots whenever you're going faster or slower, lower RPM. Uh, I would need to, I would need more information on that. Like I'm, that one's a, that's a good question that I would need to kind of think about. Um, does anybody besides Zerno have a good auger with 64 to 83 mil burrs? Not that I am aware of. Um, I know the Bentwood does, but it's 63 mils and they, it's their own design burr. So you can't fit anything else in it. Um, but from what I've come across and opened up, I have not seen any regardless of size. Honestly, are there any cutting blades on an auger or does it pre break just with torque and flat services? Now, some, oh, the Mazer Philos 06, the Mazer Philos, the new one that came out, does have a pre breaking auger. It has a very wide, like it, 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 the corkscrew part doesn't even do a full 360 around it. It's like part of it. So it looks when it's spinning, it, it looks like it's wobbling. Um, but it is essentially a blade. Like it's, it's almost sharp. It's a very pronounced ridge. Um, I wish it was not as long as it was. I wish it was more corkscrewed uh, to slow the feed down to the burrs, but it is a very long auger. Um, and so I would imagine that does a very efficient job at cutting, but it seems like it feeds really quickly, uh, which was probably because how much torque it takes in order to feed it. So they probably lessened the amount of ridges because it was overpowering the motor. Um. Do you think a robust auger will have a large impact on conical grinding? No, I don't. Conical grinding, you're kind of, maybe it'll help with heat damage on the, the grounds themselves, but I don't think that an auger and cones is going to improve very much. Um, cones are just, they're cones. Um, the Zerno, I mean, I like the Zerno. Do, definitely know they're going to do an 80 millimeter one. 
you should know that. Okay. So if you might want to wait out, so you don't have FOMO later, it might be worth it, but it won't be cheap. Uh, but what you have to think about is people go, why don't they do 98 with an 80 millimeter Zerno and a pre-breaking auger and the fact that they'll be blind birds, I imagine, because they're doing 64 blind, you will have a lot more cutting space than a 98 millimeter screwed no auger system. So yes, you have the Legome 01 that's now 102 millimeters. There is much more cutting space with an 80 millimeter blind burr Zerno that has a massive pre-breaking auger. That's going to be a lot more uh, the, the work will be spread out in a lot more surface area, if that makes sense. Um, okay, I think I'm going to call it quits. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, thank you for joining. Um, and don't get FOMO. What I'm saying here doesn't mean that the DF83V or the Time War of 7 or whatever, I've not even tested the Time War to see how the auger works on it. Don't get FOMO. Zerno is like the only one that I can use as, as uh, proof that an efficient auger does something different. It doesn't necessarily mean you need it, right? There's always going to be something that is attractive that we're going to want to jump on. And there's something I could tell you every week about different grinders and aspects of them that are better than other grinders that you might already have. But that doesn't mean that there's something about your grinder that's not better than something else, right? Like the Zerno doesn't have variable RPM and maybe that's something you would want. So don't listen to this and think, oh my God, I need to get this out or the other. If that's not the intent of this, that's never the intent of any of my videos. The intent of my videos is to help educate, to help us understand what's happening and to hopefully inspire manufacturers to go in new directions instead of just remaking the same old SAMO, which seems to be a rut we're in for the most part. We have very little innovation. That's actually good innovation outside of like minor things. Okay, we'll add a deionizer. Okay, we'll add 300 levels of RPM, whatever it is. We need some sort of, you know, bigger innovation, like when the first blind burrs were created, right? Or when variable RPM was first put into a grinder uh, or when, you know, it's stuff like that, right? So augers have been around forever. Um, like they're an old, 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 old Malkunigs, old Malkunigs. They have augers, right? So Anyway, uh, and Blind Burrs, actually, that was in an old, old, old Malkonig, fun fact, like from the 70s or something. But anyway, okay, I think that is it. Thank you so much for coming along. Thank you for joining in the chat. Thank you for, uh, you know, being nerds with me. Um, make sure you're, you know, subscribe to this if you're not. Make sure you like it if you haven't. Uh, make sure to uh, be cool cats. All right, I'll chat with you later and uh, hope you brew something tasty. Cheers. <laughs>